August 21st, 2024, Board of Douglas County Commissioners study session, work session. Uh, we have a four o'clock work session today. We do not actually have a 5.30 business meeting today. Uh, we don't take public comment at our work sessions, but we do very much invite any public comment as people often get in touch with us by email or um, next week we will have a 5.30 business meeting that will have um, general public comment. If anyone hears something from this meeting that they would like to communicate back with us, either of those are, are, are great options. Um, pretty excited to have our extension council here. A lot of familiar faces also in the room. Um, I believe, our Sarah, would you like to kick off introductions or should I just turn it to Marlon? I, I, would, I think we can have Marlon introduce his team. I just also, in case you didn't say it, because I may have missed it, we do not make any decisions at this meeting. Um, so this is for informational purposes only. Did you also say Also true. I, I did it? not, but thank okay. you for adding it. All right, thanks. Well, and I appreciate, I really appreciate working with Marlon to get this set up and to have this conversation. As a reminder, commissioners set aside $39,245 in the commissioner's budget. Uh, Marlon and I can talk about as we move forward as to how we're going to work to um, include that in the uh, extension budget uh, for 2025. And Marlon, if you could introduce your team, that'd be great. You bet. Uh, thank you so much, everybody. Uh, my name is Marlon Bates, County Extension Director for the Douglas County Extension Council. Uh, with me today is Charlie Bryan. He's the chair of our Extension Council. Uh, Sydney Hornberger is the treasurer of the executive board of the council. And Stephen Kalb is uh, the vice chair of the council. Other members of the council, uh, as well as some of our staff, uh, are sitting in the gallery behind us today. Um, so I'm going to share my screen. What Sarah and I kind of thought would be a good approach is for us to just kind of walk through a little bit of uh, some context. So just understanding that you all had some questions regarding the relationship. Um, uh, we're excited to be a part of the discussion to just um, maybe help uh, create some clarity and answer questions that you have. So uh, I won't try to spend too uh, terrible amount of time uh, walking through these slides. Um, also in the packet, we included a document that uh, the university, Kansas State University, produces uh, to assist um, Extension Council members. There's a handbook for uh, Extension Council members that's in that packet, uh, along with a narrative that just kind of describes who we are, why we're here, uh, and uh, the alignment that we have uh, between the county and, and the Extension Council. Um, in addition to that, there's other histor historical documents. So you'll see uh, some history here. Um, we had a, uh, our centennial celebration about six years ago. Uh, and so we had a volunteer who's uh, his a historian, a history buff, who uh, pieced together uh, through a, a lot of hard work um, uh, an entire sort of history of not just the cooperative extension system in Douglas County, Kansas, but sort of the approach to uh, how agricultural producers organized in the late 19th century, which kind of was a, a predecessor to the development of these government programs uh, like ours here today. Uh, so I'm going to, I guess I'll just say a, a, one thing about this uh, screenshot or this slide that's above you or in front of you here today. Um, we have a lot going on at the Extension Office, and, and some of it is very much directly related to what has always been, uh, or for 50 plus years, has been uh, part and parcel to the work of, of the Cooperative Extension Service, not just here in Douglas County or across the state of Kansas, but certainly across the entire country. Um, and, and in addition to that, we have some other things that you may not necessarily be aware of that are uh, efforts of ours or uh, that we're close collaborators on like the Douglas County Fair, um, the Call Valley Farm Tour, and uh, we'll talk a little bit about this Heartland Regional Food Business Center piece. We also su provide staff support to the Douglas County 4-H <laughs> Foundation. So some of those things we might get to uh, in later on, but I just wanted to make sure that you understood sort of the context of all those different logos. So uh, we are federally funded, and as such, we are equal opportunity providers and employers, and we're uh, mandated to state that anytime we're uh, providing a, a public presentation. So we always want to make sure that folks are aware of that, and if they have needs for accommodation or uh, complaints regarding uh, potential problems, then there is recourse for that. Uh, we're not going to spend a lot of time in the 19th century, but just wanted to let you know. Um, 
Cooperative extension is uh, housed in land-grant institutions. So land-grant institutions came uh, to the United States in 1862. Um, there's a lot of effort in that arena or in that time frame that was really dedicated to how is it that we can get uh, greater access to higher education. Before the land-grant act, the Morrill Act of 1862, higher education was not something that was available to the masses. It was something that was available to the privileged. Um, so land-grant institutions really were dedicated to those three topics that you see sitting there, ag science, mechanical arts, and military science. Um, and so states were kind of on their own. So land, uh, land was provided and the states were either given the option of using the proceeds of the sales of those lands or developing on those lands these institutions of higher education that focused on those three areas. Um, and that was all well and good because then we had uh, good efforts to educate the population. We actually gave rise to a middle class in America. Um, but then about 25 years later, there was actually acknowledgement that maybe that was information, maybe we could do a little bit better. Maybe we could make sure that what we're providing in terms of that education is actually a little bit more ground truth in the states. And so the Hatch Act of 1887, created agricultural experiment stations. So if you look at like the network of the K-State Research and Extension family, you'll see, yes, a county extension office in every single county, 105 of them. But you'll also see a smattering of agricultural research stations where faculty from the land-grant university are conducting in-field research for real-world application to the farmers within that area. Um, more important in a larger state like Kansas than maybe a smaller state. Uh, but that's why we have more uh, agricultural experiment stations. Uh, finally, in 1914, this was the Smith-Lever Act that gave rise to the Cooperative Extension Service, and this was inspired by a lot of good work. So we already talked about like Grange Halls in the late 19th century, where agricultural producers were just trying to get together and identify um, common problems and, and you know, tackle them together. Um, but there were also some pioneers, and I always like to point to George Washington Carver. He had what was called a Jessup wagon that he took from Tuskegee Institute around the South to work with cotton and peanut producers to help them understand sort of the plight that they uh, faced. So declining yields, and then of course there was even declining market prices. Uh, he was a pioneer in kind of helping to bring the knowledge of the university out to the people. And that is what Cooperative Extension remains to be across the country today. Um, so that's the federal legislation that gave rise to cooperative extension through the land grant system. There's also state legislation. So there's legislation from 1915 uh, County Farm Bureau laws that um, created a cooperative extension system. And in, I think it was July 10th, 1918 was when we actually hired our first ag uh, extension agent here in Douglas County. That legislation was subsequently updated and changed significantly to the County <clears throat> Extension Council law in 1951. And then in 1991, 40 years later, uh, there was further uh, statute added to that law that allowed for individual counties to coalesce and become a single unit. Um, and so we have the handbook. Um, there's copies of the handbook over there if you'd like to have a hard copy. Excuse me, um, but that's that's the the state legislation that kind of uh, is what really brings about what we have here today. So between the 1951 and the 1991 laws, we have 67 units of cooperative extension in Kansas. So they're not all county units. Uh, Douglas County is a, a county extension council. Uh, but we're flanked to the north and south by districts. So those are three county districts, but you can see farther west, there's four and five county districts that exist in the state, and they act as a singular unit. Marlon, the numbers that are on those, is that the number of uh, agents that they qualify for based on population? Because it's not the number of counties. Right, that's actually the sequence in which okay. they became districts. Got it, thank you. Yep. So um, I'm going to I'm going to have a hard time maybe uh, sharing this if you have access to um, either those hard copies or on your computer the um, thank you Cindy the board packet there I think just a, a few things that I want to draw your attention to in this handbook. Yes. 
So on page nine of uh, this handbook, you'll note that there's kind of a Cliff's Notes version of, uh, of the County Extension Council law. Um, and so you can kind of see the duties of the extension boards as prescribed by the statute. And that spills over onto page 10 as well. So there's uh, uh, duties that are established in that uh, statute for the director of extension, who's actually also the, the dean of the College of Agriculture at Kansas State University. Um, and then at the bottom of page 11, not to skip the, the things that are in between, there's duties of the Board of County Commissioners. So just a, a quick Cliff's Notes version um, of that um, set of statutes as it relates to the operation of, of a county extension council. Uh, following that, on page, starting on page 13, there's a memorandum of understanding that really kind of establishes. So every year, our Extension Council visits this memorandum of understanding with Kansas State University and, uh, and agrees to the tenants within it. And so uh, there are you know, several things that, that are uh, in there that may be of, of relevance, but there's kind of a bulleted list that kind of says K-State Research and Extension, the university will do this, and the County Extension Council will do this. Uh, and those are kind of nicely paired because they sort of relate to each other, 1 through 17. And then starting on page 19 Martin, is, is can the I ask statute. You? Okay, of course. Ahead. So back on page 11, I, of course, drilled right to the duties of the Board of County Commissioners, well, right? I flagged it. Yes. <laughs> and can you explain, I mean, clarify to me how we approve, amend, modify, or approve, amendify, or modify the budget proposed by the Executive Board? I mean, we've had work sessions with extension, but sure. do you see that as part of our budget process or is that something different? Yeah, very much. Okay. Yeah, so if you wanted to read um, 2610, so there's reference the, in the, the parenthetical mm -hmm. at the end of that statement, 2610 is the specific statute. Uh, you'll find that, Commissioner Kelly, at the top of page 20. Okay. And so that's just kind of just prescribes like the process, right? Um, and, and Sarah and I have had conversations regarding that process and, and there's, yeah, I think maybe there's room for conversation there about like what, what, what do we need to be doing? What do we, uh, what's working? And so, yeah, it's, it's there. Other questions? Uh, so I was just stating that on page 19 is where the statute starts. So this is actually the statute um, relative to county extension councils. And then after that, on page 27 is where the, at the separate uh, statutes, statutes for uh, districts begins. Those are the 1991 laws. Which we aren't. Which we are not, right. In order to be a district, you would have to have multiple counties involved. That's one of them. And I don't want to sidelight any of the presentation you're bringing, but there's always been discussion about op looking at that as an option, which I think it's maybe not an actively pursued option at the moment, but looking at neighboring counties to see if, if anyone wanted to district. Yeah, we have had conversations with one specific county. Um, and actually, those were, I, I feel like, pretty constructive conversations. I'm not sure the appetite really existed um, among all parties in, in the conversation. Um, but you know what? What was helpful in that was kind of trying to figure out, like, how is it that we could work together better? Um, as opposed to just, like, taking stock of, like, the whole hog option of, like, let's form an extension district, right? Uh, like, that's probably not step one. So, um, so yes, those conversations have been held on multiple occasions. In fact, I believe um, in 2006 or seven, the, that was almost before you, uh, where Douglas and Shawnee were uh, contemplating uh, entering into such an arrangement, but the uh, Shawnee County Commission uh, rejected that. And so it, it never made it to an agenda of yours, as I understand it. Um, more recently, there have been conversations within the last probably four years, I would say. Um, and one of the differences there is that 
I mean, that's why there's two sets of statutes. One, when you're dealing with a county for budget, and then as, but districts then are their own taxing authority, correct? That's correct. Okay. Yeah. Um, I was going to say, you know, one of the positive things that came out of those conversations is um, we actually are now contracting. So the Douglas County Extension Council is now contracting with the Shawnee County Extension Council for bookkeeping uh, services. So they have an accountant on staff. We do not. And so um, the opportunity presented itself for us to kind of think about that opportunity for collaboration. And we saw that as one of the opportunities we continue to do that. We're in uh, our, our second year of that collaboration. One of the other things that you'll find in the handbook um, in the in the statutes is kind of the prescription for the makeup of county extension councils. Uh, so what you'll see is that there are to be 24 elected officials, uh, six within each of four areas of interest, um, agricultural and natural resources, uh, family and consumer sciences, 4-H youth development, and community and economic development. So those are our four programming areas as described uh, by a state statute. And so we have four, I'm sorry, six people, uh, Douglas County residents uh, of the age of 18 or greater, who serve in each one of those program areas. And that body of 24 is what makes up the Douglas County Extension Council. So those are all elected officials. And now, I think the community understanding of extension misses some of those pieces, significant big pieces that extension does in the community. And I think, you know, 4-H is kind of the one that people maybe connect with and, and know about, but it is, like you said, far broader than that. Absolutely right. Um, you know, if we look at the sort of legacy extension work prior to the 1951 statute, certainly we were working in agriculture and youth and, and then home and home economics, family consumer sciences. Um, and so those are those are definitely things that have been with us since the beginning. Um, but the community economic development and then, of course, the how we do our work, those are things those all are things that have evolved through time. Um, so what that means, so the, the Extension Council members serve a two-year term, uh, which means that every year, half of the Extension Council members are uh, ending a term. They can serve two consecutive terms. And so some of those who are ending their term may be terming out, or they may be eligible for a second term. But we, we elect uh, at our election in October, uh, 12 people annually to serve uh, in these official capacities. After that, um, as prescribed by the statute, so no, no less than 10 days after uh, the election, we hold an annual meeting of the Extension Council. At that meeting, the, the Extension Council, that body of 24, gathers, they meet, and uh, they, they take care of a couple pieces of business, not the least of which is electing nine members from within their ranks to serve as the executive board of the Extension Council. And so that executive board is the board that meets with us um, on a monthly basis, uh, and they've got their own description of duties uh, described in uh, the statute as well. Uh, so just wanted to make sure that we understood that there's an Extension Council is 24 members, but they have an executive board of nine. Any questions about any of that? Okay, very good. So I mentioned that we had our centennial. We had a big celebration. Uh, 100 years in this uh, county is a, a big deal, we think. And so we're uh, very proud of uh, all 100 years of that work. Uh, doing what we can to improve the lives and livelihoods of the folks, individuals, uh, organizations, and uh, families in, in, uh, in this county. So um, we're now at 107. And a couple of years ago, our executive board uh, did engage in a uh, strategic planning process. We had a work session last year. Thank you for that. Uh, on that um, planning process, but we engaged our, a host of volunteers. Uh, we have over 400 volunteers who contribute tremendous effort to help us further our mission. Um, and then, of course, we have our 24 member extension council and then the nine member executive board on top of that. Through all that engagement, plus the staff, uh, we, were, we, we came up with a, a new vision, mission, and values for 
uh, for just the Douglas County Extension Council. And so we hope that you've reviewed those and that you appreciate those. Um, but they're different than what K-State Research and Extension has as a, a mission and vision. Um, it's not that we don't agree uh, with those things, but you know what we do is nuanced and we wanna make sure that we localize as much as possible to remain relevant to the stakeholders that we have here locally. So how do we operationalize all of this work within those four areas? Um, it's through people. You know, a significant proportion of our budget goes to uh, salaries. And I know it can be confusing, even uh, for me, I've been the director for more than seven years and the mix of funding that comes together for some of these positions uh, can, can be um, perplexing. So I'll just try to be quick about this, um, but clear. So uh, on the top row, you have county extension agents, and those are the ones that are um, named in uh, the statutes uh, that we're, we are to hire. And so the, the sort of cooperative role between the university and uh, the local extension council, uh, are, the, the statute kind of says how we determine qualifications for these people, uh, how we uh, solicit applications for those, and how we uh, select them and set their salaries. So that's, that's a role that's explicitly uh, between the university and the Extension Council. So we have five Extension agents. One, um, uh, I'll just start with me because I'm on the left. Obviously County Extension Director, but also Community and Economic Development Agent. Uh, we also have um, Community Health and Wellness Agent. Caitlin Piney Sharon is our horticulture natural resources agent. Uh, Nikki is our 4 H and youth development agent. And then Margie is our agriculture agent. So those are five agent level. Those all five of those folks are jointly employed by the extension council and the university. So they're jointly employed, uh, which means that their salary, the, the money for the pays their salary comes both from the local extension council and the university. Uh, on, on the next row, and I'm sorry, my, uh, I'll just pay attention to the screen down here. We have program assistants. So uh, Nikki is our agriculture and horticulture program assistant and Nancy is our 4-H youth development program assistant. In addition to those two, we also have office professionals uh, right underneath them. Alicia is our communications coordinator and Cheyenne is our office professional. Um, all four of these people are exclusively employed by the Extension Council. Three of those individuals are on the county's health plan, and the county has a separate line item in your budget for the employer contribution to that health plan for those three people. You said three of them, but not all four? Correct. Uh, one of them is half-time, not benefits eligible. Uh, so in addition to those four, we have uh, a couple of grant funded folks. So Hillary is our new Call Valley Farm Tour coordinator. Uh, we said goodbye to Lori, who had been doing that job for uh, a decade plus earlier this year. So Hillary and, and then Jenny is the executive director for Livewell Douglas County. So these two people are also exclusively employed by the Extension Council, but those are soft dollars, so to speak, that we bring in. Uh, that's not money from your allocation that pays for their salaries. Uh, and then one of them is also on your um, benefit plan, but we use the grant funds to pay the employer share. So that employer share is not included in your line item for employer share health benefits for Extension Council. Uh, we are uh, currently uh, sitting with one SNAPED nutrition, nutrition educator, that's Tessa. Uh, we said goodbye to Sophia last week. Uh, she's off to, to be an agent in another county, actually. Um, so this is a, a federal grant that actually passed through uh, uh, the, the state of Kansas and then the university and then us. Uh, so I don't know if they're going to find more entities to pass it through before it comes to us in the future or not. Uh, but that's SNAP Ed Nutrition Education. That's funding that comes from the Farm Bill, much like the Smith Lever Act funds that come to the university to support uh, a cooperative extension work. Um, and so we apply on an annual basis uh, competitively to secure funds to have SNAP Ed Nutrition Educators. And we've had two uh, full time SNAP educators for, for some time. Uh, that's a person who's entirely employed by the university and uh, whose uh, salary is not reflected in our budget in any way, shape, or form, either of those two people. 
Uh, and then finally, I'll just point to Candace. She is the executive uh, administrator for the Douglas County Fair Board. Technically, she's not an Extension Council employee. She's an employee of the Douglas County Fair Board, but we have her on our payroll as an in-kind service because she is the only employee of the Douglas County Fair Board. And when that position was created 25 years ago, um, the agreement was made that uh, this would be an individual who would be on the payroll of the Extension Council, and then the Fair Board would just reimburse um, dollar for dollar so it doesn't cost them a dime to have uh, their employee in in our office uh, or for us to service their payroll or take care of whatever other overhead things uh, which we wouldn't want to do because um, we love the close collaboration we have with the, with the fair board any Marlon? questions about yeah that? i do uh, the number of agents and which agents um, we have in douglas county is that's a conversation with k-state we don't have full autonomy over that is that right we do have an allocation we get an allocation from the university our allocation is five if um, we want more than five we may have it but we will pay 100 percent minus 1500 dollars uh, if you read the statute the university is on the hook to pay 1500 dollars uh, towards the agent's salary that's minimum so they would have to do that uh, but other than that absolutely everything else would be on the local unit and my next question with that um the the number of extension agents is based on population or how do they determine that i don't know the answer to that i don't i seriously doubt i mean maybe there's some formula that includes uh population but it's it's not um there's got to be a lot of other things that are taken into consideration because there are many counties that are very small that have two agents if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. There's some counties that have one. Um, I, I'd have to find out what their formula is for allocating those positions. Harlan, when you say it's funded by the Extension Council, can you talk about what revenues come to the Extension Council? Was there a specific thing just generally? I, I'm just interested in like what your profile of all the funding that comes in. I know you guys have some fee based things as sure. well as county funding. So yeah. when you're thinking about, you know, you said, I heard you say that state agents are paid mostly from K state, but also from the extension council. Well, I didn't say that they're mostly paid from the extension council. They do have okay. some funding that comes from the university. Uh, but even that's ambiguous. Um, so yeah, I'm going to try to answer your question, Commissioner Kelly, and if I'm going the wrong direction, yeah. just let me know. Um, when you are contemplating our budget proposals, one of the lines that you see is non-appropriated funds, um, or maybe we change that language this year to program funds or something like that. Uh, and that, that does, so that, that accounts for what revenues we think we're going to be bringing in which could be for things like grants uh, or fee for service. So if we charge $20 for a workshop, for instance, um, there's revenue that, that gets accounted for in, in there. Um, we also have, you know, our volunteer groups are doing fundraising. And so I think there's, there's some of that work, but it's not like that fundraising kind of goes to the bottom line of the Extension Council because those funds tend to stay with those volunteer groups as much as I, I, that's a goal of mine uh, anyway. Um, and then I think in, in addition, so maybe more specifically, like, let's just take this live well executive director position. So we received the blue cross blue shield pathways to a healthy Kansas grant in 2020. That was a four year grant. We got $50,000 a year towards, uh, employing a, a full time director for live well to help us achieve sort of the deliverables that we agreed to with that grant. Um, but that wasn't enough to, to pay uh, the, a competitive salary, so we were able to secure additional funding from partners uh, to, to help make that a whole picture. Uh, so those are uh, partners that care about community health, uh, the Douglas County Community Foundation and uh, Lawrence Douglas County Public Health. Uh, so between what we've historically brought in with uh, the Blue Cross Blue Shield funds plus what we've been able to secure uh, from those uh, generous partners, we, we've been able to employ a full-time executive director there. 
Um, the Call Valley Farm Tour position is actually self-funded because we charge ticket fee for the farm tour. Uh, if you have not been on the farm tour, we encourage you to do that. It's the 20th anniversary this year. We're, there's going to be t-shirts, so you could even buy a t-shirt. <laughs> As I understand, they're ready to get picked up, so you could swing by soon. And it is the first full weekend in October, right? Always the first full weekend okay. in October. Just a little advertising there. Thank you. So I think, I think uh, Commissioner Kelly's question, if I can kind of dial in. So some of these uh, funding pieces are kind of you know, restricted funds. They are you know, a grant for a particular thing or a fee for a particular right. service. So like with the extension agents um, or the uh, salary positions that are, that are strictly from the extension council, would it be safe to say that for, for an agent, there's some funding from K-State and the balance of that funding is from Douglas County. Yes. Okay, because I know we've had the discussion uh, and needing to have kind of a further discussion on what is Douglas County's role in terms of like cost of living increases with staff. Yeah. Um, and it's been, I think maybe a little nebulous about you know, who's, what, what part of our funding um, is going towards that and you know, what other funding sources are also supporting that. So just needing us, all of us to kind of have a shared understanding of what is the full financial relationship between the county and extension. Oh. Um, and it's not just the salary, but there's, I mean, some other in-kind kinds of things too. Oh, absolutely. And I believe uh, Sarah may have some things that we can, we can talk about uh, on the in-kind stuff. And there's in-kind stuff from the university as well. <clears throat> um, well, yeah, so I feel like the, the answer to the question about like the cost of living adjustments uh, is like we have two lines of revenue that fund the organization, the fund, you know, uh, the hard dollar people, uh, and and that's Kansas State University and 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 you, and so between those two, whatever that adds up to, that can be our salary line for the ensuing year. And so uh, if those numbers don't change, uh, then we have to get creative. We have gotten creative, um, some good ways and some bad ways. Some bad ways included in 2020, we, we let go of 1.5 FTEs. Um, but some good ways um, means like when we're doing those non-appropriated transactions, we're trying to raise funds so that we can supplement the the bottom line so that we can increase the salary line specifically. Um, you know, as far as I know, uh, historically, that's never been the case. If you look at uh, the historical budgets for the Douglas County Extension Council since 1951, those non-appropriated transactions have never um, exceeded those non-appropriated expenses to the degree that we could actually meaningfully uh, add to uh, the salary line with those dollars. And we've been doing that for for the last four or five years at this point. Does that get to it? I think one follow-up question that we might have, and it doesn't necessarily have to be now, maybe something that comes back to us would be, what's the history of cost of living increases for staff, uh, both agents and non-agents through the Extension Council um, that they've allocated for staff, but also that what portion K-State, what percent increase K-State has done for their particular part of it. And that kind of helps give us some context about yeah. where our no, role fair. fits in. Yeah, um, well, uh, the university can do what the legislature says they can. Um, that may not be entirely correct, but that's how I interpret it. <laughs> so don't call me on it. Um, so for instance, in 2025, we'll get 2% increase. Now that's a 2% increase in the university's portion, not a 2% increase in any university employee's salary, who most of which comes from the county. Um, prior to that, I couldn't tell you the last time there was an adjustment. Um, in, in all honesty, I would have to go back and look, but I want to say maybe in 2018, they restored a cut that they had taken in 2017. That's close to true, if it's not the truth, uh, timeline wise. Uh, and, and there was, because there was a callback, the president had to do a callback. And so there was, uh, money that was going to go to agent salaries specifically, uh, that had to be sent back to the university. The university was going to provide that. That was supposed to be part of what the university was fulfilling in our budget. Uh, and that number was smaller that year because of the callback. 
Uh, and then it was smaller again when the next budget year came through, but then you know, mid mid year, um, they were able to restore it back to what it had been. Other than that, Commissioner Willie, there's very little movement on uh, those numbers from the university. So let me, let me summarize what I think I hear you saying is that there is state legislation that says we have to have extension councils and that we have an expectation of having agents for those state legislated councils. And there are dollars that are that are allocated from the state to the university to pay for those. What you haven't seen over a long period of time is increases to those allocations that would mirror the increases that we would expect for employees of any type. You know, I mean, you talk 2%, you saw it to 2% once, but you haven't seen it at all. And, and so, it would seem to you that the expectation from the state is that counties would pick up the difference to cover what they have legislated. Is that what I understand you saying? Um, I, I, I think how you characterize that Commissioner Kelly is sort of, yeah, that's the plight of, of a state employee. Okay. And in our specific situation, um, we we have the ability to get creative. I couldn't tell you uh, how that compares to departments uh, in, at the state government, but um, we have the ability when we're not handed down uh, additional funds for salary increases or cost of living adjustments for our staff to get creative and think about how we're going to pay them more because that's what we have to do through time. Um, I hope other state employees departments have similar flexibility, but I don't know. Well, I would say, you know, in, in some of the conversations that Marlon and I have had, this began, this relate, I mean, county is used to unusual relationships. That's what being in county government is like, is that we have um, a, no relationship with any community partner is exactly the same as any other relationship with any other community partner. And to that end, it reminded me a lot of conversations I have involving district court. Um, so statutorily, we are, we are required to provide for the courts. Um, and there are a number of positions we fund for the courts. However, they are treated as, and um, cost of living adjustments are given as their uh, OJA, so the Office of Judicial Administration employees. So. I work every year with courts administrator and she says many years we're not getting anything okay I don't put anything in oh we're getting one percent and and so in essence they are treated as you know justice uh, OJ employees but uh, they are you know they're on they're on our health insurance and they're on our payroll so they really aren't treated as county employees in that sense so in some ways I I think that's part of the dilemma of what we have. We wouldn't have to treat it like you were saying, Commissioner Kelly, where, you know, oh, they're they're going to get an increase, but no increase from the state. And there's other ways to look at that. Okay. Moving on. Um, so the university has uh, done a tremendous amount of sort of ground truthing the work um, and I think also kind of aligning the needs of Kansans with uh, the Extension Council law. So those four program areas you'll see kind of reflected in here. Uh, but these are the grand challenges uh, that, that we believe that all Kansas, all Kansans face. And so um, this is an important element of how we do our work because, you know, there are many layers of the Extension Council or the Extension Onion. Uh, the Council is one of them. The agents are another one of them. The state specialists are included there. And then sort of the collaboration among all of those entities to identify needs, to develop programs, uh, to report, report back to the, the, the legislature, the state legislature, and also uh, the federal government because there's the state and federal monies that flow to the university to support that um, the work of extension and so there's I think just 
I just want to say that there's a coalescing of effort, there's a coalescing of um, objectives. And so whenever we're reporting as 67 independent units of extension across the state back up to uh, the university, uh, they, they can uh, sort of coherently understand what we're, we're saying that we did and they can report that back uh, with relative ease. So these are the five program areas uh, that aren't exactly the same four uh, as named in the, in the statute, but very much aligned. <laughs> And then I'm just going to go through a handful of slides just to maybe apprise you. I'm not going to include everything here. We're not going to get to everything. Some uh, some program areas are left out of this. I apologize for that. Um, but it's uh, just you know, for a matter of time. We have the Extension Master Gardener program. There are 180 plus uh, volunteers. Miss um, Hornberger is one of them. Uh, dedicated volunteers who uh, contribute uh, countless hours to uh, the education, uh, horticultural education and demonstration uh, across the county. In addition to that, we have this 4-H program. So we have 10 community clubs across the county, uh, but that's not all we do. We do a, a lot of other outreach to engage youth uh, to provide for a nurturing environment surrounded by caring adults who uh, are leaders in their communities and they're positioned well uh, to succeed in life and pursue uh, the things that make them happy. So we're very proud of the youth. And if you were able to come to the fair uh, just a month ago or so, uh, you probably saw many of them uh, hard at work, or at least you saw their hard work. We also have the SNAP-Ed Nutrition Education Program. That's that state grant that we get that comes through the federal government and then the state. Um, that's a nutrition education program, but it's also very much focused on physical activity. So the target audience here are SNAP eligible uh, constituents. So people who are eligible, not necessarily signed up for the benefit, but uh, that would be eligible for the benefit. And so uh, that's the work that Tessa does. She does uh, a, a tremendous amount of um, working with partners to identify uh, potential audiences to make sure that we're serving everybody that we can with that program. In addition to uh, providing the education, our master food volunteers also help um, SNAP eligible residents apply for that benefit. That's not something that we would be able to do, certainly um, because of the federal funding streams that help pay the salaries of our nutrition educators and our agents. Uh, but our volunteers are, are uh, more than happy to do that. And so. We have them at several places across the community quite regularly where they're interacting with SNAP eligible recipients to encourage them and help them uh, fill out that uh, not so simple and straightforward application. And of course, there's also the education piece. So getting into the kitchen and helping people develop knife skills and understand how to make uh, um, smart nutritional choices with limited food dollars that they have. Uh, often means uh, food preparation. And so there's a lot of opportunities that we tackle just in engaging audiences in that way. I mentioned that we have uh, more than just our club programs uh, with the 4-H Youth Development Program. So a lot of uh, STEM focused and STEM oriented education. And so these were the three uh, relatively large day camps that we hosted uh, through the course of this summer uh, with the assistance of our uh, our summer engagement interns that uh, we, we enjoyed uh, for the last few years. And then our, our agriculture and, and our natural resource work is uh, also very focused, you know, a little more on the, the rural side of the county. Certainly that master gardener program and the consumer horticulture program is, is uh, a little more oriented in the urban part of the county, but um, We've got uh, people on our staff who are incredibly uh, specialized in understanding uh, transition to natives and not just like how you sort of practically make that work, but maybe making the case for why ecologically and economically that makes sense. So Sharon's been uh, really good at bringing that kind of work forward to our county. Um, we don't have an updated graphic for our 2024 interns, but I did want to share with, our, with you our 2023 interns. Um, incredible work just hitting a lot of people dedicating a lot of hours and doing a lot of uh, really good work we did ask you in our supplemental uh, request for funding to continue doing that because it is uh, incredibly impactful on the ag front we do uh, a lot of uh, really good work collaborating with partners uh, to sort of create awareness about better and improved practices 
So not too long ago, we did a livestock watering systems tour um, and Margit and her colleagues and partners have been doing wonderful work to bring those educational programs to that community. And I just also wanted to touch on this. A couple of years, we've done this whole farm health program, which is really all about economic health, soil health, and mental health uh, within our agricultural community. Um, so generally well received and I think just uh, a, a, a very necessary effort in our uh, agricultural community to make sure that these are conversations that people are having out loud and we're happy to lead them. Uh, last thing I'll just say programmatically, we uh, are part of a five state region. I'm a co-PI on a federal $25 million federal grant. There are a lot of partners, so we, 25 million came to the region. Uh, but we just opened up uh, business builder grants. So we've got $3.4 million that we're getting ready to distribute to food and farm related uh, businesses. Uh, to strengthen the food system and so if, if uh, you know one of the elements that I think you should remember that we're very much engaged in is food system development economic <laughs> development uh, and this is just uh, sort of evidence of like we're trying to find those opportunities to bring in additional revenue to offset salary or to bring on additional staff who can help us um, you know nimbly uh, address the issues that we see here locally but that federal funders are also happy to, to fund. Um, and so uh, we're, we're still, we just launched this on Thursday and so it's, we think it's a big deal and we hope Kansas is uh, very, very competitive in the five state region. Marlon, thank you for that news. I'm def I flagged that when I was reading the, um, <clears throat> uh, the slides as something unfamiliar to me. So uh, tell me that, say that number one more time that, that um, K-State, extension is a statewide is going to be distributing not just douglas county extension i is i mean i know you said it's part of five right. um state region but how much is allocated so it's four point it, so there's a, almost 11 million dollars total but it's a four-year grant we're breaking that up over three calls for applications so it's about i think 3.4 million dollars i think is what we're saying is available this round um and you see that little corner of Arkansas on that map that kind of complicates things. <laughs> <laughs> I did notice that and I thought, wait, where is the rest of Arkansas? Why did they get left they out? They <laughs> are in the southern region. Um, so so the, each of the five whole states uh, will receive 15% uh, of that $3.4 million, but then that still leaves, I think, 25%. Is that right? Let me check my math. Um, yes. Thank you. So this still leaves 25% of the pool that will be sort of like open com competitive. So we'll at least get 15% of that, um, but really we're, we're, we're providing technical assistance to prime applicants so that they are competitive. So they've got the pieces in place. So it's wraparound services. Those are the, those are the positions that we're hiring. We've got one on staff now. We're interviewing the second one next week um to make sure that these people are competitive and that's our objective is to snag as much of that 25 percent as possible and yes that cool. is statewide thank you you anticipated my next question which was like what sort of support and assistance for um entities interested in that so frankly that's actually so. the entire intent of the whole project right oh, so the cool. heartland regional food business center is all about providing technical assistance to small medium scale uh, food and farm related businesses uh, nothing about production, but after production. Um, and so we at Kansas State University, at K-State Research and Extension, we've got collab, we've got four collaborators that we often refer folks to. Um, but yeah, it's all a, a massive technical assistance network. Yep. Marlon, you mentioned a couple of people are hired to help roll out that program. Is that hired at the state level for K-State or? They are. So, yeah, because this is funds that went to the university. Um, however, I am on that grant, and one of the things that I lobbied for is to have one of those positions in Douglas County. So the one that we're interviewing for next week will be located in our office. And we have office space available? We do now. All right. Thanks to your maintenance staff. So finally, uh, I'm just going to let you know that you should follow us on uh, Instagram and Facebook. <laughs> and then you should also come to our open house uh, on Thursday, September 5th. That's the Thursday after Memorial Day. I'm sorry, Labor Day. Um, that'll be an opportunity for you to uh, 
more casually interact with the Extension Council, have um, discussions with our staff, learn a little bit about who they are and what they do, and then uh, enjoy a meal and get an update uh, from those four program development committees, those four program areas as um, uh, illustrated in the uh, statute. They'll all be giving updates on their progress toward their elements within the strategic plans. Uh, and so we hope that you can make it. There are little postcards over there if anybody in the room wants to snag one, you're more than welcome to do that. Um, I'm ready to talk about whatever else you, you all are ready to talk about. So uh, I'll stop sharing. Yeah. Commissioners, I can share, you know, one of the things we talked about at budget time was kind of um, services already sort of provided in kind. And uh, I, Marlon and I talked about this last week, and so I thought I would just put this on um, up for commissioners. So the county provides, as we talked about earlier, the county provides health insurance for some of the employees. Their uh, extension council is in a county building. We do some building maintenance and grounds maintenance for extension. Uh, they are a part of our general liability package, including liability and property. Uh, we cover auto, they're part of our cyber crime, our cyber liability, and we they're part of our audit. And there's been, I, I hate to say the word consulting, uh, I would say there's been some coordination with county staff and um, extension staff around employment and employment law. Uh, so it's not like it's independent consulting. Um, and then extension is responsible for their uh, those items that you see there. Um, and I'm happy to answer any questions commissioners have on kind of how that's been, how that, those things have been divided up. So imagine some of the things like the audit, it's not that this portion of what we pay for the audit would be assignable to extension. I imagine many of these things are that way. Um, health insurance, of course, we could break that out specifically, but uh, do we, just trying to get a handle on uh, how do we know, like, what's the dollar amount of the value of in-kind services that we provide for extension now? I, I think it would be hard to dial into some of those because they're not really broken out. I mean, commissioners, we, we haven't spent a lot of time to try to do that, um, you know, and, and um, you know, the, the value of the asset, the value of the maintenance, like that, that's really not something that we've done a lot. So if it's important, um, you know, I'd like direction from the commission if you really want us to put a dollar amount to it. I just thought the description was probably more helpful than the actual dollar amount. At this point, yes. Um, just as we have conversations, I'm not sure what commissioners necessarily, what we will be looking for as we uh, have the conversation about releasing the dollars from our um, commissioner's line item to extension, uh, what information we're looking to have um, or what steps we're looking for from extension. And that just may be the next conversation. I'll just say this is really helpful. <laughs> and I think it, it's going to further the conversation more. It's clear to me so far that extension is very different than a community partner. It's, and we need to, I think we have lumped extension into some of our community and tried to make that work. But in some ways in reading what the statute says, I think we almost need to, commissioners, I think we just need to talk about it a little bit about how we might treat it differently. There's, it's very specific in here that there is a, there's a mill levy amount that is assigned to running extension. I don't know that we know exactly what that is, right? Because well, of we, all those other in kind. Hmm. Go ahead, Sarah. Well, I was saying we could, I would say that part of the statute to me feels very similar to other parts of county statutes from the 1950s in terms of how budget forms are put together. Okay. So to me, that is a, as someone who reads a lot of statutes related to county budgets, that sounds a lot like the, the exact same language they ask us to do when we put together a lot of budgets. I can calculate what um, 500 and, you know, their amount for 2024 of $549,354, what that amounts to in mill levy. And I, that's what I relate that to. Yeah, is that part of it. Yeah, and, and county budget. That makes sense to me. But I, but I think to Commissioner Willie's point, there's other services that we are providing extension that may not be in that calculation. Would that be fair to say? Yeah. 
and that um, I, I think this is why the conversation is really good for us to have, because as we think about a mill levy amount and the amount of um, burden that puts on our taxpayers and the amount of dollars that generates, that would give us, rather than looking at a, a sole number, we can see how that is adjusted based on property values to determine how to assign dollars or allocate dollars to to extension. I, I just sort of think we've used a different process and I'm interested in talking with commissioners if there's something we think maybe works a little better for a partner that, because I don't know that we have many, I like the example of the courts because that is one that just sort of we're told this is what we need to do and we need to provide for it. But we don't have many other partners that I'm aware of that come to us and say, we have statute here that says you need to pay for this. So I think it's just a unique situation to me that maybe I hadn't fully appreciated in the past. Well, and I would say with district court in that sense, like I review line item budget detail with district court. Um, if, you know, so it's, they're a line item and there, you know, you all see line item detail in their budget. So it kind of also works both ways. So in terms of the closeness and the amount of information that we have um, on district court, um, I meet with the district, the chief judge monthly. Um, you know, we we work very, you know, they're on our IT system, except they also have some state IT. So, and then I would say on that list, you know, when health insurance costs have gone up, we didn't, you know, those were included in your budget costs. The same goes with our liability coverage, which I will mention has gone up a lot. Um, you know, we don't have separate conversations in terms of like, well, extension, you know, needs to, to, I don't, I don't make a separate supplemental request to the commission for that. It's a part of our budget process in total. This is what our liability policy is requiring of us. So it's, it, I mean, I would say there are many areas where we already work very closely like a county department or like a relationship we have with a department that has, you know, substantial outside funding, such as the district court. But there's a couple of things where we don't have that level of detail or information. And, you know, part of what I, I, w I really do want to hear what commissioner's thoughts are on this, but I would also say Marlon and I have discussed this and I think we're very open to continued you know, dialogue and conversation about, you know, are there some ways that we can bring some recommendations to you? Um, but, you know, so I don't want you to feel like you got to solve it all tonight. One of the things you mentioned that has struck me is the, the level of detail we get over the courts is the same as the level of detail we get for um, our departments. The level of detail, financial detail we get from extension is is much, much less. It's more like how we what we get from community partners. And so that's one of the differences also is like how much we know about the budget for extension. Um, one of the other pieces would be I, if district court, just using that as an example, comes to us and wants a position funded, we can say yes or no. Um, if that position is funded but not filled, that's money that does not then go to them anyway. So like, uh, I know one of the methods for extension to kind of make payroll was, you know, to have, leave those, you know, one and a half FTEs un, you know, unfilled, which that's another relationship that has to be kind of figured out. So if, um, if, if Douglas County is stepping up and doing like cost of living adjustments for employees, if that employee is then not, if that position is vacant, who keeps that money becomes the other part of the conversation. I, I just think a lot of this is yet to be kind of hammered out. Um, I did have a meeting with Marlon last week or so, and um, and one of the things that, that was suggested that there may be some um, some precedents in the courts for what happens in that situation, specifically for <laughs> extension, which might help uh, help us know how to move forward too. So like I said, I don't think we're gonna solve it all tonight, but um, I think we're kind of ferreting out some of the things that we need to talk about. Other questions, thoughts? Yeah, I, I, I wanna make sure we give staff direction on how to move forward here and I I think what I would like to see is is Marlon and, and Sarah work together to sort of come up with what is the process for reviewing a budget because it says that we need and, and reviewing it in the detail that would be similar for a department because I think even in the statute it says we 
need to look at the budget, we need to amend, we need to send it back to the board, then it needs to come back to us. There's a whole series of there that, to my knowledge, we haven't really done it that way before. I mean, we've had requests, we look at them and we either turn it down or not, instead of sending it back to the board and saying, we don't think we can fund this level. How would you do things differently? And they can send it back and say, we don't want to do anything differently. Okay, fine. And then we have to make the decisions that we have to make. But I think there's room in there for, for Sarah, your team to work with Marlon and sort of come up with what you think that process might look like. Um, I'm not sure it's a Douglas County department, but I, I wonder if there's sort of a middle ground there that maybe looks a little bit like how we deal with courts, how we deal with other electeds, because we have, you have an elected board as you describe it. Um, and, you know, there may be a place in there that says, you know, this is how we deal with other electeds in that as well. You know, we get a recommendation, for example, from the DA's office. Um, that's not a recommendation, but it's a budget request from the DA's office. And then we either fund that or we don't fund that. Um, is that more of what we're looking at with extension than seeing them as a community partner where we set the budget here every year and then you can add for more or less to that? As I say that out loud, it does sound sort of like what we do with our departments as well. But I, I just think that there is maybe some more steps in there that, that could be developed by staff with Marlon's work. I, I agree. And I, I think also, you know, um, you know, also the way the statutes for the, I mean, these statutes have not been updated since I believe the 50s and the, you know, role of county administrators in that process is also a little different. Um, so I review their budget every year and I make a recommendation to the county commission as a part of the proposed budget. So in my view, you do review their budget every year. Um, and you see their financials in terms of what's in your community partner agreement place uh, like that. Um, and so I, I feel like we're very much in conformance with the statute and I wouldn't want to give anyone any impression that we're not. Um, but I think the notion of how much detail you get in terms of like how we look at their county funded options um, is different than like how we treat district court. Um, so that's maybe something we could work on. I would also say like in, in the case of district court and, and also with like the district attorney and other electeds, I mean, and each one of those are different, you know, like there's statutes about the sheriff has to be in the general fund. And so like those are, are obviously much closer, um, you know, district court can be a little bit more separate depending on how much outside support they have. And if you're, it's also it, it's complicated. We're we're lucky that we have a one court district. If you're in a multi county district, it's it is also complicated, and they don't have their own taxing authority like a multi county extension council would. So, this is why intergovernmental relations is job number one for county administrators. But I so I think that there's some complications in there. But I think there's some things that we could work through. I don't know that they need to be in our bank. I mean, for example, those funds for district court are maintained. Um, by the county, we are their bank um, and their checks come from us. So I don't know that we need those kinds of things in this situation, because you know, if it's not broke, don't fix it. But we also do need to have conversations about um, what the appropriate amount of detail, oversight and uh, accountability is provided. And I think a key point in that as far as determining what our role is, is that extension does have a 24 person elected board. So it's different than like working with an elected um, or the district court, which does not answer to an elected besides us um, for their funding. So it's it's just trying to find out what everybody's role is without, you know, um, and make that as streamlined as possible to that um, the oversight is provided by a 24 person board or the, and the nine person kind of executive council of that. Um, but the, but the, bottom line for the budget comes for, not the whole budget, but for our portion of the budget comes from us. So just trying to figure out what's the appropriate level of ask. Yeah, that. and I think that that's the part that's been, I think helpful for both Marlon and I is just, I don't know that extension staff understood that we are used to that level of complexity on all kinds, I mean that, you know, it is, 
we have a lot of complexity when it comes to different community partners and they're not all the same and we don't treat them all the same. Um, but I do think we, we're we not quite in that sweet spot yet where we have a full understanding of, of what that relationship is and what commissioners are comfortable with in that sense. I'll offer just one more thought mostly for fellow commissioners is, you know, I, um, I think for me, what there is to, to chew on is a little bit of how we categorize them in terms of the way that the county commission approaches our budget process in terms of um, internal departments, community partners, um, and then within community partners in recent years, we've been talking, you know, getting even more nuanced and talking about service agreements versus community partner agreements. And are we helping with operational costs and programmatic costs versus services provided to county residents um, with, you know, public dollars? So I think that's where I'm sort of sitting in the conversation, I tend to ag agree with Sarah's assessment that I think based on my review of of the statutes um, in, in preparing for this meeting, I do think that like we are meeting that criteria. However, but the unanswered question to me is how do we think through what our appropriate contribution and responsibility is to those it, cost of living increases? And that's been such a topic of conversation across community partners and some, a hard nut for us to crack, so to speak. And I do think that Extension Council is a, a particularly unique example. We've highlighted a lot of reasons why there's some uniqueness to it and sort of talked about it in terms of um, some similarities, but still differences with the relationships with, um, with district court and state funded agencies that counties have statutory responsibilities for. To me, I think, of it a little bit more akin still with plenty of uniqueness and difference but to the health department and that our health department in Douglas County is, Lawrence Douglas County is a independent health board but state statute still requires us to fund it we they are the other um, entity in the community the only other partner at this point that we also fund health insurance for am i remembering that right yep. sarah <laughs> um that used to be a few more folks and that we've now it's extension and health department only and so and while health department's board is not an elected board it's an independent body the the elected members of the extension council's board is also an independent body governed by all these different statutes and and past laws so uh, at least in my head as i've been trying to sort of unpack um to me the big unanswered question of um how do we think through and and calculate for our contribution to those natural cost of living increases over time um i i personally take don't really have any issue with um or see any problems with how the budget process has gone per se. I think there's been some clarity to be had, which this was really helpful for, so I appreciate the, the deep dive and further conversation. Um, but to just figure out how do we contemplate our um, responsibility and how that, it, it, and recognize that it is different from other community partners, that there is a difference to it, but it might help us to think through how we consider it for the health department when we as a commission are thinking through how do we approach those ever-growing requests in the future. Each year we get more of those requests from more entities that rely on the county for funding in one degree or another. So. Um, that, that's just kind of where my head's at and where I'm, I'm focused and offer that, that comparison to the health department if it feels helpful for framing it a bit. It, it does, and I, I think there is something, one of the things that we talked about at our budget session, and, and I hope this conversation leads to more conversations about it, is where do we help all of our community partners sort of find some clarity in their request of when do I come to the county asking for an increase, a cost of living increase? And do we treat the health department and extension differently than we would treat another community partner that came? That's what I think we're looking for here. Um, because I, and I appreciate across um, the community the need for cost of living increases for services. Um, but I, but this one, and I appreciate health department seems different to me in some way. And I, 
I just think we need to continue to refine what I think a process that has made a lot of progress over the past, you know, five, six years. Um, but I think for, for the partner and for us and for partners who aren't in the room right now, we need to continue to get clearer about it um, so that we, we sort of manage as much disappointment as we can. That's kind of how this conversation fits into kind of our larger you know, philosophical discussions about cost of living um, with partners. But I wanted to kind of circle back that I think some clarity came up that I think is maybe helpful for all of us to to, to use this language around that um, just taking agents in particular that for extension agents, a portion of their uh, salary comes from K state and the balance of their salary comes from the county and that it's the role of the extension council then to manage healthy relationships amongst you know between those partners um, instead of saying the extension council covers that other part well then then it'd be your responsibility to do cost of living if instead we're saying that the county is covering the other the balance of that salary then that's a discussion i think that comes back to us um, in some way, shape, or form. So that's, uh, and I think that might help, you know, your your board also to kind of. I think we've struggled with the the relationship part of it too, of um, of of how to how does the council initiate and, and engage healthy relationships with the county? And I think we're getting there very much. Uh, but I think that that maybe it's semantics, but I think it helps us move forward to the next part of the conversation. Uh, I would say we have. It's been so much fun. I've blown past our five o'clock end time, um, but I would like to say we have um, we have money as part of the extension conversation in our commissioner's line item budget, and I think that we will owe it to extension to to line out what exactly are we looking for X Y Z that releases that money, um, and I think we that may not be today's conversation because I think we've run out of time for it. But I just I just want to recognize that that is. Uh, that is the next conversation that needs to be had so that we are, uh, can provide some absolute clarity about about that need. If commissioners are okay with that, I guess my my thought was is that Marlon and I could continue to talk, sort of talk about how this could go and bring you something to react to as opposed to just sort of nebulously, how do you want to do it, if that's okay. Um, and then, but obviously if you don't like our approach, you can decide which how you want to handle it differently. Would that work? Yes. Okay. And I think so, there are three different buckets of that money or three different line items. So uh, well, I think we're going to look at that. And then I, but I want to, I want to guess I, I hope we have the flexibility to, to fig may not be in the same buckets. Cause I think that's part of what's held us back in the past is, you know, not understanding each other's buckets from that perspective. So is that help is if commissioners are okay with that, I, I think Marlon and I can bring you a proposal that you can then decide if you like or don't like. I think that's excellent. Okay. Sure. I'd also be remiss because I think it's important while we have our friends with extension here to sort of say, you know, this is in many ways, sometimes the frustration that you might hear is not unlike frustration that we have with many things the state of Kansas tells us to do and pay for, <laughs> and then consequently puts restrictions on us on how we can have revenue neutral rates and how we can raise taxes. So please don't in I'm famous for saying I'm not frustrated at you. I am frustrated near you. Mm -hmm. um, and that is, this is difficult. The state tells us these are our responsibilities to, to fund, and yet then they make it very difficult for us to come up with local resources to pay for them. So I, I, I just think that's important for you guys to understand that they do this through community corrections. They do this through lots of different areas where uh, the county has responsibility to help fund, but yet then they tell us don't raise property taxes. I have one more question, Commissioner, if it's okay. And so we're going to five. It has, I, I read in the statute that you can have your own number as long as it's based on the number. Are you adding eight, 16 more members to your extension council with five, or are you going to set at 24 and make it's adjustments? 20, yeah, it'll, it'll be 24. Okay. Um, and, and so there's provision in the statute for situations where counties have in excess of three commissioners. Yeah, okay. That, is, that doesn't change the number of members of the extension council. Okay. Just wanted to give you a chance to advertise if you're looking for members of the extension <laughs> well, council. Well, we have to elect 12 people every year, so we're always in there. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Commissioners, anything else? Um, do you have any response for us, Marlon, before we kind of... No response, just gratitude. So thanks for uh, all the, the wonderful support that you've provided over the course of the years. Um, 
So I, I, I think we acknowledge that you have a lot of difficult decisions to make. Um, and we're glad to provide greater clarity and glad to engage uh, at any time for any amount of time to, to help nurture those relationships as you were, were referring to Commissioner Willie. Thank you. I appreciate everyone's patience that we've gone until 517. Um, just a reminder, we, we, we don't take public comment on our work sessions, but we also don't take any action. Um, any actions about this funding will come back to a full public meeting. Uh, we do not have a 530 business meeting tonight, so we are adjourned. Thank you all for being here. <laughs>